How are y'all doing? Just wanted to uh, welcome you again to the uh, Marshalls Museum here in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Uh, again, thanks for coming in on our weekly Facebook Live. I hope we get a number of folks in today. Uh, for those who are not aware, um, today's episode we're going to be talking about uh, Hispanic Americans and their impact on the Marshall Service, seeing as how we are in the middle of uh, Hispanic uh, Culture Month uh, or Hispanic Awareness Month. It is runs from September 15th to October 15th, and I thought this would be as good a time as any to uh, talk a little bit about that subject uh, here today. Before we do that, though, a little, couple words about our sponsor, United States Marshalls Museum, the best Marshalls Museum there is. Uh, we, uh, again, as one of the things that I will talk about every single time is that we uh, are very definitely, as much as I'm happy to be sitting here in a building and uh, have a collection behind me in a building and we are able to talk to you online and help get not just the curatorial stuff that I'm doing, but our education programs, uh, the uh, educator uh, series that we are doing, which we're going to talk about more of that, I believe, next week or the week after, um, Educator Resource Series. Uh, we are doing a lot of different things, but we cannot wait to have you here at the building to see the uh, museum experience when it gets built. Uh, that is, as much as we were wanting to make sure that we built the building when we knew where the money's coming from, we are still fundraising towards the goal of having our museum experience and the uh, exhibits that are gonna be in there. And in order to do that, uh, if any amount that you want to help out with, uh, as I've done almost every week that I do this, I will say you can go to our webpage, you go to our Facebook page, which will take you to the webpage. Uh, you can get into our Buy a Brick campaign. $250 gets you a four inch by eight inch brick. $500 gets you a eight inch by eight inch brick that you can personalize either one of those. And it's gonna go out on the walk behind the building uh, from the front parking lot down to the river walk and right past the statue, which is gonna be placed uh, representing the light horse, uh, the law enforcement from the five tribes of Oklahoma. Uh, you can also, you can go to our museum store and we have our handy dandy, we have our handy dandy face masks that when I'm not trying to do it quickly and look cool and stuff, it actually goes on well. Uh, you can get those at our museum store. Uh, Casey will be throwing in the links to all this stuff. Uh, so uh, she'll be able to help share some of that. So you can, uh, if you're interested in helping out the museum, I know uh, we don't all have checkbooks that allow us to write uh, five, six, seven figure checks, but uh, $10 for a mask. 250, 500 for a brick, uh, or just any amount that you can throw into our GoFundMe. Any of that stuff is always a wonderful thing. Uh, it feels weird doing this because I know it's just kind of like uh, listening to NPR a couple times a year. Well, we aren't offering up any free tote bags or coffee mugs yet, but uh, we are looking for your help to uh, continue our programming. Uh, before I get into this today, I want to say, uh, I see Sharon's on today. Hello, Sharon. Uh, anybody else who pops in, especially if you're a regular, please feel free to uh, let me know and uh, I'd be more than happy to recognize anyone who shows up. Um, among the things I want to talk about today, um, Hispanic culture has had a lot to do with the Marshall Service uh, since pretty close to the very beginning. Uh, when you think back to when the West was the Ohio River Valley, everything past the Mississippi River for a good long time was uh, Spanish territory. Uh, later on, some of it became French, obviously, because then we wouldn't have Louisiana that we purchased from the French, um, thus the Louisiana Purchase. But uh, what is what was the Louisiana Territory was under French control for, I mean, Spanish control for a very long time. Uh, about half of our country was Spanish, of uh, the, uh, there were conquistadors in uh, New Mexico. I'm a proud graduate of Texas El Paso. Uh, they had a Thanksgiving ceremony and dinner at the uh, 
the, the pass of the Rio Grande of the North, uh, that was uh, where El Paso is right now, uh, 500 years ago. And so, I mean, it's just, there's a huge history of uh, America and Hispanic culture uh, wound together and tied together. And so that ends up playing, as you'll see, in the Marshall Service. And just for clarification with some different folks, in case you're not aware, Hispanic is, refers to the language, Latino refers to the geographical area. So if you speak Spanish, you are Hispanic. If you are from Central South America, you're a Latino. So in other words, people from Spain, they're Hispanic, uh, they are not Latino. People from Brazil are Latino, they're not Hispanic. But for a lot of the other parts of Central and South America, uh, Hispanic, Hispanic and Latino pretty much uh, overlap. So that's kind of why some folks who don't know these terms get a little bit confused. And that's perfectly all right, because we can fix it by giving you more education and knowledge. Uh, with the uh, study that we're looking at right now, uh, one of my favorite pieces in our collection, and I'm going to flip over to this, is one of the oldest things that we have in the collection. This is a certificate appointing uh, Pablo Noriega as the United States Marshal for the Southern District of California. This particular document is dated the 30th of September in 1850 and signed by President Millard Fillmore. And so uh, this particular document is really, it, it's really important in that it helps run back the clock to let people understand uh, how important this was. Uh, California becomes the 31st state in 1850. Uh, it's broken up into the Northern District and the Southern District of California. Following the Civil War, they revert it back to just one district. And then they, re they split out those uh, districts again in 1886. And then 1966, uh, add on the Eastern and the Central Districts of California. So California is now four districts. But um, I think it's telling that the very first marshal for the Southern District of California was Pablo Noriega. Pablo Noriega was an influential landowner, uh, rancher in uh, Southern California. I've had a chance to do some research on him. Uh, and it really amazes me how little has actually gotten out about him. But Pablo Noriega was also an early member of the uh, state, legislator, state legislature in California. Um, but he ended up, uh, as I said, he was the first U.S. Marshal for the Southern District of California. And uh, really just a really interesting guy. The, uh, since, since then, uh, there were uh, 1894, Nicholas Covia Rubias, oh, sorry, Cova Rubias. Uh, beyond that, uh, Bob DeGuerra in 1987 was the acting uh, U.S. Marshal. I'm not sure if Bob uh, is Hispanic. Uh, Bob DeGuerra, by the way, was also involved in the takedown of uh, uh, Christopher Boyce. So I believe, yeah, I believe Bob DeGuerra was involved in that one. Uh, I'm sure there will be uh, folks on our uh, Facebook page who will correct that because I know that some of the U.S. Marshals, some of the deputies who have been involved in some of these different operations, I know that they uh, lurk on some of our broadcasts and I know that they'll uh, correct me. Uh, Central District of California, uh, starting in 1977, uh, Luis Villascusa. Uh, you've got Julio Gonzalez in 82, Samuel Chichino in 88, uh, Tony Perez in 94. I know Tony Perez. I want to say I've met Tony Perez. By the way, uh, so he was the U.S. Marshal there. Uh, I believe Tony was also a deputy. Uh, and then Michael Ramon uh, in 94. I don't have much of the information following uh, 1994. Uh, beyond that, uh, Frederick Asola in the Northern District in 24, I'm assuming he's Hispanic based off the last name. Uh, as you would probably guess, not a lot of Hispanics in uh, the Northern District of California, uh, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of history of Hispanic U.S. Marshals in the Southern District of California, and that's just the Marshals, that's not even counting the deputies. 
as you can probably imagine, Puerto Rico has seen a long history of U.S. Marshals uh, who are Hispanic, uh, well, not as long as you might imagine. Uh, it didn't start, even though the uh, District of Puerto Rico first was established in 1900, uh, the first uh, Hispanic uh, marshal there was Santos Bujo in 1955, followed by Jose Lopez in 70, uh, Robert Salazar in 84, uh, Herman Wershing Rodriguez in 85. So very definitely, that, that was a whole secession. Uh, Panama Canal Zone. Uh, surprisingly, uh, as far as I can tell, the only Hispanic U.S. Marshal there was uh, Miguel Otero, uh, 1917 to 1921. Uh, beyond that, uh, was a lot of, from what I can tell, non-Hispanic. And in some of these cases, I am just only be able to, only able to determine this in making assumptions based on their names. Uh, in many of these cases, it's pretty obvious as to what's going on, but. Um, New Mexico uh, in the 1880s. You have Romulo Martinez in 85, 1885, uh, Trinidad Romero, 1889, uh, Secundino Romero in 1912, and I'm wondering if Trinidad and Secundino are relatives. Uh, Secundino uh, was skipped for about uh, eight years and then he ended up back in the seat. That's something that happens quite often in uh, to the role of marshal is depending on who's elected president, it's very much a political position. Uh, much Throughout much of history, uh, and this is going to have, I'm really kind of pointing out this fact because it's going to show a uh, really important uh, mention on someone here in a bit. Uh, Anytime that the presidential party changes, whether it's like Republican to Democrat, back to Republican, back to Democrat, it's, there's a number of times where you have an individual who has been a marshal in successive Republican or successive Democrat uh, administrations, and they might get replaced when that party is out of power. Uh, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, there was a U.S. marshal in the state of Montana was marshaled three different times across uh, three different Republican presidents, uh, starting with uh, Eisenhower, I believe it was. And so really just some interesting stuff. Uh, so uh, Joseph Tondre in 1926, Philippe Sanchez Ibaca in 1934, uh, Martin Lopez, uh, Martin Lopez in 1951, uh, Dave Fresquez in 61, Emilio Narajo in 65, Doroteo Baca, in 69, Benny Martinez in 77, Jack, uh, I'm just, I don't know if it's Jackson Roop or Jackson Rupe in 81, uh, Dorte Obaca back again in 82. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, I'm sorry, Dorte Obaca back in 86, uh, Alfonso Solis in 87, John Sanchez in 94. And so that's just, and I'm sure there were other uh, Hispanic U.S. Marshals in these positions. And there have been uh, hundreds of Hispanic deputies serving across the nation, uh, everywhere from California to Florida, to New York, to Illinois, to obviously across the uh, Southwest. Uh, anywhere, I mean, just one of the things that has happened across the Marshall Service is they've gotten really good at recognizing the benefits of having people of different cultures in different locations because of the work that they have to do, having a cultural understanding within a particular community has really helped them to work in uh, just to get their job done safely across the country. Uh, the, uh, one of the reasons why I was specifically pointing out uh, how some, certain marshals end up coming in and out of their positions, uh, I wanted to bring up right now the current U.S. Marshal for the District of Arizona, uh, David Gonzalez. Uh, David Gonzalez, I think, is currently the longest serving U.S. Marshal who's currently serving. Um, I don't think he has the uh, record yet for uh, longest serving and the most time served as a U.S. Marshal, but uh, he was appointed by uh, President Bush, and 
uh, George W. Bush, not H.W. George W. Bush, he was uh, appointed by him uh, early 2000s. Uh, he was uh, reappointed during Bush's second term, appointed by, or reappointed again by President Barack Obama twice, and then reappointed by President Trump. And so right now he is in his fifth term as the U.S. Marshal for the District of Arizona. And I wouldn't be surprised if he continues to want to do that, if he ends up continuing to uh, stay in that position, if he's willing to. I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, regardless of the uh, outcome of this next election, if he would end up staying there as well. Uh, but uh, David Gonzalez is a perfect example of today's modern U.S. Marshals, whereas U.S. Marshals in the past, uh, especially 1800s into the early 1900s, were quite often from uh, just political appointees. If you were in an area not uh, kind of frontier, frontera related, uh, but if you were in an area, especially like here in Oklahoma, it would be probably somebody seen, uh, well, Western District of Arkansas or overseeing what's now Oklahoma uh, or some of the different other districts across the West where you were dealing very much open spaces, less in larger communities, more out in rural areas uh, without even small towns around, uh, the people who are being looked at as marshals are people who are going to be uh, planning to be dealing more with uh, just working with uh, whether you're talking about the criminal community, whether you're talking about just being able to be out. And if you have to not only be able to operate the office but be in a gunfight, uh, that could quite often happen, uh, but any more gets to the point where you're looking at people, it, well, it's, in a lot of other places, it might be a purely political job. And there were a number of people, especially in large cities, who were benefits of political machines in different uh, communities. Uh, any more though, especially since they really started heavily professionalized the role of deputy marshal towards the end of the uh, 1990s, the role of United States Marshal became much more professional. And so now uh, we, are ver we very much have to have, as in the role of a US Marshal, they have to have some sort of law enforcement background. So whether you have the current, uh, uh, the current US Marshal in Rhode Island, for example, was former uh, ATF. Uh, but a lot of them, I think uh, there's, there's a number of US Marshals around the country, former uh, uh, sheriffs, uh, chiefs of police in different communities, uh, heads of state police in different communities. Uh, and that was the case with David Gonzalez. He was the commander of the chief of staff for the Arizona Department of Public Safety, essentially their highway patrol, their state police. Uh, and so he started out all the way down as a beat cop, worked his way up through the organization, ended up getting to the highest point in the organization, and then ended up moving over to uh, be the U.S. Marshal, and he's been in that position now for uh, coming up on uh, most of 20 years. And so, I mean, that's something to be said, especially going across uh, both parties. So, uh, David Gonzalez, uh, just amazing person uh, by all accounts, uh, with the background of his employment as well as a lot of the other things that he's done. Uh, really uh, kind of special to be in that kind of a situation for that long. Uh, and then uh, the other, one of the other things I wanted to talk about uh, specifically with this is I often do uh, with any of our historic discussions is they all tie somehow again back to our Hall of Honor about uh, line of duty deaths and people in particular communities who have given their lives in order to uh, do the job of the United States Marshals. And so I have a uh, few names I want to, uh, some people I want to talk about here. Uh, the people, these are all names of people who are currently in our Hall of Honor. Uh, these are people who, based on uh, what we know of them, uh, we know they're Hispanic. Uh, if there are other people who are in the Hall of Honor who are Hispanic who I don't mention, uh, my apologies, and I would love to be corrected on that. Uh, these are the obvious ones that I was able to find after uh, just knowing what I know about the uh, people in the Hall of Honor. Uh, one of them, uh, I'm going to, so I don't forget him, I'm going to name him up front. 
Uh, he was one of the four people I mentioned two weeks ago during the 9-11 special. If you are interested in the history of the Marshal Service uh, during 9-11, uh, by all means, take a look a couple weeks back in our live videos. If you come to our Facebook page and go to the live section, uh, you'll see the 9-11 one that I did uh, from the Hall of Honor. Uh, Zacharias, Zach Toro, uh, I talked about him during that. Zach Toro uh, was a, is considered a line of duty death. Uh, he was, he worked uh, on the pile at Ground Zero and ended up uh, passing away eventually as a result of cancers which developed from his exposure to some of the chemicals and compounds that were, uh, were present there at the area. Um, as you might remember, we've, uh, he's one of the four and unfortunately I know that at some point we're going to be dealing with more. But uh, Zach Toro uh, is one of the five names I want to mention today uh, as a result of, well, just being uh, Hispanic deputies uh, who, uh, there's uh, people who gave their lives in the line of duty, uh, and they are Hispanic. Uh, first one, 1891, October 30th. So we're coming up, uh, next month will be uh, his anniversary. Uh, I've seen several spellings of the name in some of the uh, different documents uh, from this time frame. So, uh, Calixto Garcia or uh, Chilixto Garcia. I've seen uh, Celestro. I've seen uh, uh, Calixtro. I've seen uh, like three or four different versions of his first name. Uh, he was uh, recruited as posse for Deputy U.S. Marshal George Wise to help him serve a warrant on Francisco Pancho Flores, a known smuggler of Mezcal. Uh, when Wise approached Flores to arrest him, Flores appeared to surrender only to spring up with a knife and wound Wise mortally. Uh, so Deputy U.S. Marshal George Wise was killed at that also. Uh, Garcia was in pursuit when Flores turned suddenly and struck Garcia in the chest with a knife, apparently hitting him directly in the heart. Uh, Glisto Garcia was buried in Laredo, Texas. And so uh, we have more information about that if you are interested in finding out, as well as these other names I will be talking about. Uh, Charlie Escalante, June 6, 1909. Charlie Escalante was a deputy U.S. Marshal in Arizona. He was a Yuma Indian police officer. Yeah, so this is also, uh, we've identified about 15 or 20 names in the Hall of Honor who are also uh, American Indian. Um, Charlie Escalante was a Yuma Indian police officer who also carried a commission as a deputy U.S. Marshal for the District of Arizona Territory. On the evening of May 18, 1909, Escalante returned home from his normal shift when he heard yelling from the direction of nearby railroad tracks. He went to investigate and found four men, apparently drunk, walking on the tracks. When he caught up with the men and asked where they were going, one grabbed Escalante, and as they grappled, a second man stabbed him. Escalante died of his wounds 19 days later. Uh, Gil Zinaga uh, was tried and found of guilty of manslaughter. He was sentenced to serve one year in Los Angeles County Jail, fined one dollar. I, that just blows my mind that that's all that would have ended up happening as a result of killing a deputy marshal. Uh, granted one year in the Los Angeles County, I'm assuming that was either uh, Los Angeles County, Arizona, or Los Angeles County, uh, California, uh, fined one dollar. I, I can't imagine a year there would be enjoyable, uh, but still, one dollar. Um, 2000, I'm going to say actually, I'm going to come back to that one. Uh, 1971, Marcelo Garza Moya, uh, Special Deputy U.S. Marshal in Oklahoma. He was a deputy constable in Corpus Christi, Texas, and on March 30th, 1971, was serving as a guard for Deputy U.S. Marshal Hilton Shorey. Together, they transferred three prisoners from Texas to the federal prison in Oklahoma. Uh, it's over west of Oklahoma City. Uh, before picking up two others for transfer to Texarkana. As they were driving back, a water truck that had been stopped on the highway shoulder suddenly pulled out in front of their car. Shorey, who was driving, swerved to avoid an accident, lost control of the vehicle, crashing into oncoming traffic. He died instantly. Moya and the two prisoners, Lionel Roberts and Gary Wayne Sweeney, all died at a nearby hospital. And 
2011, this is a name I've mentioned uh, before on here, usually in relation to his partner. Uh, Roger Castillo, it was a special deputy U.S. Marshal in Florida. Uh, Roger Castillo was a sergeant in the Miami-Dade Police Department and a special deputy U.S. Marshal attached to the U.S. Marshal's Regional Fugitive Task Force. On Thursday, January 20th, 2011, four members of the task force, Castillo, Detective Amanda Hayworth, Detective Dieter Beecher, and Detective Oscar Placentia, were looking for a murder suspect named Johnny Sims. Wearing bullet resistant vests, Castillo and Hayworth started to the front of the duplex where Sims was suspected to be hiding, while Placentia and Beecher went to the rear. Hayworth approached the front door, knocked, and was immediately met with gunfire from within the house, falling from a gunshot to the head. Sims bolted out the front door and shot again, hitting Castillo in the head. Placentia came running from the back while Sims headed towards him, both opened fire. Sims was shot and went down. Roger Castillo died at the scene. Hayworth and Sims both died of their wounds as well. A combined funeral for Roger Castillo, Sergeant Roger Castillo and Detective Amanda Hayworth was held at the America Airlines Arena in Miami. Uh, that's this story, especially uh, regarding uh, the story with Castillo and Hayworth. Uh, the Marshalls Museum is really proud to be able to talk about stories like this uh, because in this case, they were task force officers and they're recognized as such in our Hall of Honor. Uh, task force officers have a special relationship with the marshal service in that the marshal service with the agreements they have with these subordinate organizations and there goes my lights because we are energy saving there we go for some reason I can't get that to go past 20 minutes however uh, now if I had a dollar for every time my lights went off on me in here I would be a rich rich man and we would probably have a museum exhibit. Uh, the, so anyway, the task force officers, the task force officers, uh, the marshal service makes agreements with uh, city, county, state, other federal organizations that they are able to have these officers come in in order to help support their operations, uh, whether it's uh, fugitive ops or other things. Or, and on the other side of that, the marshals can bring this force in to help local uh, organizations, say a community needs, they have a dangerous fugitive in their area that they know that they don't have the resources for, so they can bring the full force of the marshal service in. And so uh, with the agreements that the marshal service has, the marshal service will, uh, they, they will have the people as part of their team and they receive additional training and they do other things. But if something were to happen, like as what happened in the case of Castillo and Hayworth, uh, the Marshal Service doesn't recognize them as a Marshal Service line of duty death. Miami-Dade Police Department, in this case, recognized Castillo and Hayworth as their line of duty death. And so the Marshal Service, they, as a result of that uh, relationship, they do not recognize the task force officers on their wall in Crystal City by, and this is by agreement with the or different parent organizations. However, because we are not the Marshal Service, we are just privileged enough to be able to help tell their story. We get to recognize these people on our uh, our wall in our Hall of Honor. So there's, uh, there's about 20 or 30 names in there that are task force officers we get to recognize. Uh, so we are very proud of that fact. Uh, one little sad side note on this is 2011, it was, it was really kind of a bad year for the Marshall Service, and I'll let anybody who wants to go back and look, look up that history. Uh, the downside of it is there were a number of task force officers and deputy marshals who were killed that year, lost in the line of duty. Uh, while everyone was at the uh, funeral for Castillo and Hayworth, there was, at the other end of Florida, uh, up in the Panhandle, I think it was, there was a, an operation that was occurring, another fugitive operation, another task force, and uh, things uh, went pear-shaped with that, and two more, def two more uh, task force officers were killed uh, that day, and they found out about that while they were at, a number of cops found out about that while they were at the funeral for Castillo and Hayworth, and just, I can, cannot imagine the punch to the stomach that that was. Uh, but as a result of how different things happened in 2011, the Marshal Service, as they've done in many other operations, in many other cases where bad things happen, they went through and they recognized that there were changes that needed to be made 
in training and preparation for operations in looking at how things were done. And they wanted to make sure that uh, they made uh, survivability paramount. And so those changes were made. 2011, you see a, an inordinate number of people who were added to the hall of honor, or the, 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 the list and as line of duty deaths. And since then, we we're back to like one or two a year. Uh, the one person who so far who's passed away this year was a result from 9-11. Uh, there were two people uh, last year. Uh, one was a physical fitness training incident. Uh, another one was a task force officer in Illinois. Uh, so, I mean, the marshal service is doing what they can to help safeguard these people, to help make sure that their lives are not lost. Uh, unfortunately, it takes bad incidents like this to make these lessons. So I want to get back to, before I get out of here, I want to give you one more good shot of the, uh, there we go. I'll just keep it right there on uh, Pablo Noriega's uh, certificate. If anyone has a question about anything that we have talked about today, and I am seeing, I've not seen a whole lot of comments today. I am guessing that we are, let's see here. I'm looking really quickly just to see if there's been other messages that I have missed as a result of the, uh, this may be how my interface is going here. But if anybody has any questions that they have uh, about this subject, if there's anything that you, uh, for example, if there's people that I miss, if there is someone you know who is uh, Hispanic and related to the Marshal Service and you felt should have been mentioned today, by all means, let me know. I mean, there's there have been some really amazing stories. Uh, I uh, thank you, Sharon. I am uh, one of the. One of the things, one of the stories, one of my favorite stories, uh, was a uh, why I cannot remember his name right now. And somebody's going to pop in, and yes. they're going to uh, know his name. And the uh, there, one of my favorite cases of uh, someone who's Hispanic who ended up uh, getting involved with the marshal service was a young man who was born in Cuba. Uh, his family emigrated to Cuba. Um, I don't think it was part of the Mario Litos. Uh, I think he might have gotten to, I, I think, no, in his case, he had been, he'd gone to Spain as a, as a college student and then went from Spain to America and then gained his American citizenship. I wish I could remember his name right now. Uh, he ended up going, uh, going into the Marshal Service once he got his degree uh, worked as a deputy U.S. Marshal, worked in the Southern District of Florida, and at a large, uh, yeah, he, he couldn't have done the Mariolitos because this would have been late 80s when this happened. Uh, there was a large uh, citizenship ceremony that was held in the, in the football stadium, I believe it was at uh, Dolphin Stadium in Florida, that uh, just packed house. Uh, with just, it was one of the largest uh, citizenship ceremonies ever held in the United States. And the citizenship ceremonies being a federal court activity, who administers that? The Marshal Service. So the Marshal Service administers that. And so someone has to call the whole thing to order. Who did they have called to order? It was this young, this by then no longer a young man, but he was a deputy U.S. Marshal who had come in as a Cuban immigrant and Became a deputy, got his degree, became a deputy U.S. marshal, worked his way up through, and he got to call the uh, the whole ceremony to order as a deputy U.S. marshal. And I mean, it's just to me that's really that that's the kind of really exciting story that just just kind of gets me going some days. Uh, I don't know why I had forgotten about that story for such a long time, and I have got to go find my notes to find out, remind myself uh, what his name was. Uh, he was a Cuban American uh, who was a deputy in Miami. If anybody gets a chance to watch this and they know, uh, feel free to forward it to me. Uh, again, um, thank you, whoever. I know Sharon's here. I know a couple other folks are here watching. Uh, anytime somebody comes in, I always enjoy 
uh, throwing these on. Uh, we're gonna be, we're actually taking all of these, about each of these different individual subjects, and we're throwing them onto our uh, YouTube channel uh, here in a bit. Uh, we are uh, making it, we're gonna make them available through our uh, YouTube channel and our webpage as uh, part of our educator series. And uh, so a lot of this stuff is gonna end up being of permanent use. Uh, you guys, you all get to see it first, you get to hear me ramble on about particular subjects for uh, half an hour or so every week. Uh, if there is some subject that you would like to hear more of, if there is something that you've heard about or have come across, I already know, uh, I think next week I might be talking about filibusters, uh, and it's not the court filibuster, that, I mean the congressional filibuster that you might be thinking of. Uh, I think I'll be talking about filibusters next week because there's uh, we're coming up on the end of our socials. We send it out to them by email uh, to let some of them know. And uh, we just, the staff here at the Marshall's Service, at the Marshall's Museum, wanting to uh, wish the Marshall Service a happy birthday. Uh, we're really proud of uh, what's going on there. Uh, and so uh, if you can, we are going to be able to, uh, it looks like I lost the feed maybe there for a second from what Sharon is saying. But we are going to, uh, we said happy birthday. So uh, yeah, in case you just threw up the link for that. So uh, you can go ahead and uh, catch our happy 231st anniversary to the, uh, the birthday to the Marshall Service. Founded by George Washington, September 24th, 1789. The uh, oldest federal law enforcement agency, despite any claims that the uh, postal inspectors might try to make. Uh, we've got about 40 years on their claim, 30 or 40 years on their claims. So uh, I know they'll come and fight us for it. So uh, if you have any questions, any requests, anything you want to find out more, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email, drop me a line on Facebook, and we'll uh, do what we can. Otherwise, it's Friday afternoon. Have a safe and wonderful weekend. Go out, stay safe, wear a mask, stay away from other people unless you have to. Uh, we are, uh, and again, as a reminder, if you choose to have a mask, you can wear one of our masks. You can get our mask through uh, our webpage. And uh, Casey dropped that link earlier here in the thing. Uh, hello, Zagat. Uh, we're just about to get off. Uh, if uh, anybody needs to uh, do anything by any means, uh, go ahead and shoot me a note and we'll be more than happy to take care. Um, you guys have a wonderful weekend, stay safe, and I will see you next week, same time, uh, Fridays, 2 p.m. Central Time. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.